It's the Deadline Junkies podcast with your hosts, Jordan Emiola, Kirsten Porter, and Rand Shami. All right. Our guest today is Joe Cristalli, writer on Life in Pieces, Perfect Harmony, and the soon-to-be showrunner and executive producer on The Frasier Revival. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm technically just creator, executive producer. Chris Harris has insisted on being the sole showrunner for season one, which I'm, it's fine. It's fine. I, I didn't say showrunner. I uh, said executive producer <laughs> look i don't want to show it's too much pressure it's too much control i don't want any of that i want chris to have to deal with all that garbage and i'm just okay. gonna sit back and yell jokes from the back of the room and i'm perfectly content with the ep credit <laughs> so i think it's gonna be fine all right all right good <laughs> yeah just do the fun stuff <laughs> yeah are you re- are you gonna um, yell can you jokes? talk about are you gonna yell jokes from the back of the zoom <laughs> oh that's not bad no, it was worth going back for finishing that one. I like that. That's good. And I will. I'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll run back and I'll run. Uh, when I come up with something good, I'll, I'll go back and yell it. Okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, we're all really excited for Frasier coming back. Can you talk about the process of bringing it back and the Frasier for higher tweets? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I will say I'll, I'll be vague in some parts because we've been instructed not to say a word <laughs> of the Frasier stuff. But I think all the stuff leading up to it is, is, is fair game. And if it's not, it's honestly, it's Chris Harris's problem because I'm not the show owner. <laughs> I was, I think it was like 2014. Um, Frasier had probably been off the air for, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years or something. And I thought it would be funny. I was a writer's assistant on Last Man's in that Tim Allen show. And I, I thought it'd be funny to start a Twitter account with the sole, uh, sole goal of becoming a writer on the defunct <laughs> Frasier. It hadn't been a show in a long time. There was no talk of a reboot. I just thought if I started doing bits that you could see on Frasier, maybe they'd hire me on a show that didn't exist. So I did that for, I don't know, I did it for like four or five years to, to very mediocre acclaim. I think, you know, the tweets were getting like maybe 30 likes on a good one. Um, but then I, I, Kelsey came out in the news, Kelsey Grammer came out in the news and said, he was looking to do a reboot. And weirdly at that time, I'd also written a Frasier spec script that nobody wanted, which seemed like uh, just a great use of my time also writing a spec script for a show that had been off the air for more than a decade. <laughs> but weirdly, as I finished that script, that news came out that he wanted to do a reboot. So I, I emailed my agent. And I was basically like, just, 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 just send the script and the tweets to his producers. Maybe they'll meet with me. I mean, just, it shows at least that I have a, a knowledge of the show that's probably unsurpassed. Uh, maybe they'll meet with me and maybe I'm not a lunatic. So the producers did meet with me. They were very nice. Uh, we had a very nice meeting. I pitched them like a loose idea for what I thought a Frasier reboot could be. And they were absolutely lovely. And by the time I'd gone back to my car, I had already gotten an email that said, we're not going to use you. <laughs> no, you don't have the experience level to bring Frasier back. So no, thank you. Uh, and they were right. I think I was a staff writer on Life in Pieces at the time. Um, but I, I said to my agent, okay, so if I get, let's find somebody who has a little bit of cachet <laughs> in this town, someone who isn't me, who just has a Twitter following. Um, so I called my friend, Chris Harris, who I had worked with on High Metro Mother. He was the, like the number two there, the number three, if you count Carter and Craig as two separate entities. Um, and he was running The Great Indoors and he's been, Charming for he's the best. He's beyond smart. He's beyond funny. He's like he's in another level than a lot of the writers that I've ever worked with. Um, and I was just like, I have an idea for Frasier. You want to come help me make it like really good, and then we can go and try and take it to Kelsey. And he was like, okay. And we did. And for some reason, Kelsey liked it. And that was two and a half years ago. <laughs> so it's been a little bit of a it's been a little bit of a slow. Uh, jaunty walk down uh, the boardwalk, but we're, we're, we're getting there now. And now it's finally announced. And I, there's a chance people could see the show in the near future, which is very exciting. The process was almost as long as that explanation was. <laughs> <laughs> so basically if yeah. we get rejected, we should find somebody who is better and grab onto them. <laughs> yes. And hang on for dear life. <laughs> You find the coattails of a winner and you never let go. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without Chris Harris, man. Yeah, <laughs> that guy's well. very good. But yeah, I think I think Kelsey had heard 
I think Kelsey had heard like, I think he heard like 10 or 12 takes maybe. Like he heard a, a lot from his former writers, a lot from other showrunners. Um, but I think ours, which I, which I don't think I'm allowed to talk about. I think ours had a unique blend of diehard <laughs> fandom that was really playing into it. And it was like, if this show is going to come back, I want it to be a show that I would love as a fan. Cause I don't want to kill the thing I love most in the world because Frasier is by far my favorite show that's ever aired. So the idea of bringing it back, it has to, I don't want to say it's going to surpass Frasier. I don't want to say it's going to surpass Cheers because that's an awfully lofty <laughs> bar to set before anybody sees anything. But you want it to be close. I mean, you don't want to do, this isn't like a money grab where all the actors are in dire straits. This is a creative thing that they want to do because they love those characters and the fans love those characters. And if we can bring it back and make it the third chapter, the third act of Frasier's life, if Cheers is act one, Frasier's act two, this new iteration will be hopefully a, a, a an elegant conclusion barring another reboot <laughs> what what is it that really drew you to yeah. Frasier like what, what makes that one of your favorite shows the writing is just so good the writing is just so sharp and so good and it's one of those uh, I feel like sitcoms maybe like 15 20 years ago I feel like they had a lot more freedom their creators had a lot more sort of I don't, I don't know. What the, I, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it feels like shows today, once they get going, like Modern Family's been on the air for 11 years. So I'm sure the, the guys running Modern Family do whatever they want. But like a show that's on the air for like two years, you don't really have full creative control of what you want to do. So once you get to that, like two, three, four year mark where it really becomes your show and you can do what you want, I feel like you really start to excel and thrive and do the show you want to. And Frasier specifically was such a, was such a specific voice and tone and it was just like you wanted to you wanted to take Frazier away from Cheers and give him something and, and Cheers was so beloved so to give him a whole new thing like that bar is already beyond high and I remember reading I remember reading some article that was like the writer specifically moved him across the country to Seattle because they didn't want to have to have the crutch of, hey, look, Norm's stopping by to say hi to his old buddy <laughs> Frazier. Like they didn't want that crutch. They wanted it to be a whole new thing in a whole new city and just start all over again. And it feels like those those kinds of shows like Frasier and I feel like like Everybody Loves Raymond, I feel like Seinfeld, they were just, they were joke machines. Like there was good stories. Yeah. And I mean, you re especially with Frasier, like whenever they did a farce or whenever they did like something more uh, more convoluted, um, but the jokes are always just so good. And I feel like you can watch a show today and you're like, you're waiting for a laugh and you sort of get lost and they sort of meander a little bit. And it's just those, those shows just relied so heavily on the, the energy and the jokes. And I just love that style of show. And to, the, the idea of bringing it back is just super, super exciting. Did you watch it when I was on Must See TV? Like, no, I six? don't think so. No, yeah. I, I, I didn't start watching it till... I think, cause I think it went off the air. I want to say it went off the air in like 2004, maybe. Yep. I think. Yeah. Um, and so I was still in high school. So I think I started watching it in college on like a Netflix or like post college on Netflix. Um, but, but since then, I, I think I've seen every episode a dozen times. Like, I think like, I'll, I'll <laughs> and this is so stupid. And I don't think this counts as a name drop cause I'm working with him. But I, every time I'm with Kelsey, he'll mention something from the show, like vaguely, like he'll say, oh yeah, we did this thing with this person. And it was very funny. And I'll be like, Christine Brancy when she was Dr. Norton. And he's like, yeah, that, that's it. I'm like, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> like, he, like he knows it all, but like he's forgotten more than more like I could ever imagine. But I have, I have this weird, very, very useless, well, not so useless anymore, encyclopedic knowledge of this show, which I th think is lame but maybe it's cool. <laughs> it's unclear if Kelsey thinks it's cool. I think he thinks it's lame, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not totally sold either way. No, it's really cool that your passion for the whole show and that's, that's really I, awesome. I've basically willed this into existence. A friend of mine, my friend Matt, <laughs> who's a writer with me on Life in Pieces was basically, he said his joke is, you could have had anything you want in the whole world and you chose this. <laughs> This you could have had any dream. You pick this, which is, is is fair. Is fair. I think he's right. I think I. 
I maybe could have had other stuff, but this is what I picked. <laughs> Uh, could you talk some about your journey to becoming a staff writer? We know you worked as a writer's assistant and script coordinator, but what was your story? How did you make that leap? Well, I think, and I think I talked about this a little bit last time I was at the Q&A with you guys. It, it's, it's, I always, it, it feels like there's two ways to get into writing. It's either be so undeniably good that people would be stupid to not hire you, and that's not me, or you become an assistant and you just ingratiate yourselves with all these writers and learn as much as you can and absorb as much as you can and slowly get better over time, which is what I did. I was at How I Met Your Mother for two years and then Raising Hope for a year and then the Tim Allen Show for a year and then Life in Pieces. I started as the script coordinator and it's tough because when you first start, like at How I Met Your Mother, everyone was super smart and super talented. So like you're very hesitant to pitch jokes, you're hesitant to pitch stories Really, the only time I ever pitched is if there was a lull for more than like 35 seconds, then I'd like, what if Marshall What if Marshall has this joke about a bear? It's like, great. Okay, let's use that. Joe had something. But as you slowly, you start to gain confidence. Like, so by the time I'm on my third show or fourth show, it's like at Life in Pieces, I had now been a writer's assistant script coordinator for five years, six years. So it's just like, I'm pitching, I'm trying to pitch as much as a staff writer because I'm just I'm sick of being an assistant. I need to, at this point, you have so much confidence that's also juxtaposed with so much resentment that you're just throwing everything you can out in the hopes that someone will be like oh he's not bad let's hire him and it worked <laughs> I got I got promoted halfway through that first season of life in pieces and then it was on for four years and it was great the the, the tricky part is just it's weirdly because I think inherently conf, confidence is not a strong suit of most writers and it's you have to you're never just you're just never going to make that leap unless you believe in yourself enough to start pitching more like if people if you could be the funniest writer in the world but if you're sitting at that table or now sitting in a zoom room and nobody ever hears you talk nobody's ever going to know like you just sort of have to bite the bullet and just start throwing stuff out and once you realize that 80 percent of what you say is going to fail or bomb you're okay with it i mean nobody's <laughs> nobody's batting a thousand percent nobody's up there swinging for the fences and knocking jokes out of the park every time there it's a lot of like shitty puns and then you get past it and you find something good and I was like oh he's not awful <laughs> I can work with him again <laughs> did you ever have a moment where you were like oh I went too far or I've been saying too much or anything like that not I don't think I've ever had a moment like that I definitely had a moment where I was like because that first year time like looking around there it was like 18 writers and like 10 were executive producers and they were all the smartest, funniest people. At it. So I was instantly like, well, I definitely can't do this. I'm a fraud. <laughs> These people are so good. I can't, I just can't. Um, but that was a unique, that was a unique first job because that show, I came on the show in like season seven or season eight. So like when a show gets to that point, they have the, the cream of the crop and writers like a, a season one show, you start with a group of people, then season two, you keep the people that are really good and you bring in new people that are good. And then season three, you keep the really good people and you bring in a few more good people. So by the time you get to season eight, it's just like all-star after all-star after all-star. So you don't really have any duds left except for the, the dummies behind the computers trying to get bear jokes in every, every couple of hours. Um, but everyone there was just, I think I was very lucky to have that be my first room. Cause that was such a, such a, such a warm and collaborative room. Like they encourage the assistants to like talk and to be friendly and to be fun and engaging. So there's plenty of rooms where it's just like, okay, an assistant, we're calling you, we're calling you keyboard. Please don't look up. Just, just, just clickety clack everything down that we're saying. Uh, and that was not that room. That room was you to be, to be engaged, which was, super helpful. So you, I, I don't think you can ever, you can't ever shy away from going too far unless you're being like misogynistic or racist. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I don't think you can go too far in a comedy room barring those awful things, <laughs> but uh, there's no joke that's bad enough. Like, like unfunny wise, that's going to scar you into never talking again. Um, and if it does not the job for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then how did you get rep? Did it happen before or after your first staffing job? I had another, God, my, all my stories are so weirdly, so weird. I got an agent because at the time I was a writer's assistant on How I Met Your Mother. And I don't know if it's still a thing. Westside Reynolds was a big thing 
where you basically like somebody would have a password for West Side Rentals and you'd like share it. And then they'd have it for like a week because it costs like 50 bucks and nobody had any money in the assistant world. So I remember I was, I had gone to, I went to Syracuse and there was a Syracuse listserv out here. Basically anybody that went to Syracuse that was working in entertainment was on this email chain. And it was mostly for like, Hey, I have a PA job available or Hey, I have this old couch on my curb, come pick it up. But I had had a West Side Rentals account and I found a place. So I posted it on the website, on the listserv saying, Here's my West Side Rentals account. If anybody wants it, it's probably going to be active for another 10 days, whatever. And a bunch of people said, thank you. And said, whatever. And then this one girl had some like snarky response. And I thought it was funny. And I noticed that in her little email signature, it said uh, CA, assistant CA lit department or something, or some version of that. So I said something back to her and I made some joke and then she made another joke. And basically it ended we exchanged emails like five or six times and she goes, well, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm about to get on a plane and I can't really talk anymore. And I said, Oh great. So you have plenty of time to read something. Can I send you a script? And she read the script. And by the time she had landed, by the time she had landed, she had already sent it to her boss at CAA and he was interested in repping me. And then I was repped by that guy. And then when she was promoted to agent, like a year later, she became my agent. So now I think she's the head of the lit department. Don't quote me on that, but I think she's the head of lit at CAA, but I'm not sure. But it was only because she had CAA in her email signature. <laughs> I took a shot. Uh, yeah. I took a shot. Just uh, like in the writer's room, pitching these jokes. It's just shamelessness. You're never going to get anywhere unless you take a shot. I, I'll email somebody I haven't talked to in four years. Hey, I, I heard you're hiring. You know who's great? Me. <laughs> like, there's just, you, I, think, I think people get it. I think people understand that you can't have shame out here. You, you got to find your next gig. Which was fine. Yeah. 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 Take chances. Yeah. What was the script you sent? Can you tell us what it was? Gosh. Uh, I honestly don't know. I have no idea what I said. I I think it was probably a multicam called Couples Therapy about a husband and wife who weren't doing great and her brother moves in with them and he's a therapist. And he needed a place to stay and he ends up living there for free, but giving them couples therapy. Is that, is that it? Do you guys know if that's, if I'm right? If, I think Sounds that good. might be it. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. I think that's what it was. I think I, either Big Bang had just come out and I stole the character of Sheldon for the therapist or I predated Sheldon, but I'm, I feel like I probably stole the character of Sheldon for mine. <laughs> well, there character. is a lot of stealing that goes on in writing and in, in art in general. There's a lot of parallel thought. I don't know if there's a right. lot of stealing, but I, I, I'm sure I've been a, 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 a culprit of that myself. Yeah. We'll call it sharing. I'm basically, I'm basically stealing Frasier, so I can't really <laughs> can't say much. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, last time we talked, uh, you, you said, make sure you hang out, you have people you hang out with, want to hang out with. Um, can you talk about uh, your relationship with Chris Harris, your friendship? Oh, I hate Chris. Oh, oh Chris is the worst. <laughs> um, no, uh, yes, I think, I think um, because when I was hired as a writer's assistant on How I Met Your Mother, I don't think I was the most qualified for the job. Um, but the person hiring me basically told me it came down to you and like one or two other people. And I was, I was definitely not the most qualified, but she was like, I kind of pictured who I'd want to hang out in the room with at like when it's 11 o'clock and you don't want to be there anymore. And you won. So congratulations. Don't screw me on this. Um, <laughs> If you don't, if you don't like the people you're working with, especially Chris, who now I've been working with for two and a half years straight on this. And I, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say I text him probably once a day, if not once every other day about something inane, you have to, you have to have just, you have to have a friendly sort of playful relationship with these people. Otherwise you're just going to go crazy. Like you can't, but I don't know. I don't, I haven't worked with many people who are just like ornery or like cantankerous. Like those those people have kind of been weeded out as far as I can tell. Like, I'm sure there's still a couple running around, but I haven't worked with any of them. All the people I've worked with now are just are very sweet and funny and friendly because nobody wants, the, I, I think people have realized that it's just sort of, it's not fun to work with those people. And there's so many talented people who aren't mean that it's like, okay, well, I, we don't, I don't think we need this, this guy anymore. And it's always a guy. It's, I, I think I'm okay. Gender stereotyping there. It's, it's always the guy that's the jerk. Um, but Chris is, Chris is like super smart, super funny. And I'm very lucky to be attached to his coattails. And I think he, I think he raises my quote quite a bit because he's very good. 
and they, have to, <laughs> they don't have to pay me as much as him, but they have to get close. <laughs> <laughs> What's what's the writers' room like for Fraser right now? Like, it's just YouTube still, or is there more? Oh no, yeah, it's just me and Chris. I think because I don't think it's it's still unclear when production will actually start, so we probably won't have a room. My guess is we won't staff a room till at least the end of this year, if not next year. It's it's still such a long ways away. Um, but um, I think I think the room will mostly be staffed via nepotism. Um, <laughs> And then it's, and then it's sort of just a free for all. I'll probably just take a bunch of headshots of random people and throw darts at them and pick the, pick it that way. Um, <laughs> but th- there will be so few spots left after all the nepotism that it's hard to say how many, how many more we'll get. Um, <laughs> that's how it goes. I think. <laughs> Are you looking for more diehard fans or do you not want any competition? <laughs> nah, I'm good. I'm good. I, I'm that, I'm that guy. We don't need more of me. <laughs> who needs, who needs more of me? Well, that's the that's the nice part because when Chris and I wrote it, I mean, Chris obviously loves Frasier because he's a comedy writer and it's a great show, but he doesn't have nearly the 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 weird psychoticness about it that I do. So writing the script, it was a lot of like I'll have like a very like a one percent one percenter joke about bulldog, and Chris will be like, "Are we sure? Are we sure about this bulldog joke?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay, I'm crazy. Let's cut it." <laughs> like. It's it's a very nice give and take because while I'm trying to put stuff in that I think will satisfy the fans, he's putting stuff in that will just satisfy, which is a nice, which is I think is a is a good balance um, in a, in a in a great way. Uh, but I'm sure. Look, any comedy writer that you hire has seen Frasier and probably loves it. I mean, I can't imagine there are many people that hate Frasier, so uh, I don't think I need any uh, lunatics on par with me, but. I'm happy to see people try. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite episode of Frasier? I always lean towards um, my favorites are the, the the big farce episodes, like ski. The ski cabin is probably my favorite. I love Ham Radio is the one. If you've seen it, is the one where Frasier tricks Niles into playing like six parts of a radio teleplay, which is unbelievably <laughs> fantastic. Um, and there's actually one um, that probably is a lot of people's favorites. I think it's the last season of the show. It's the Christmas episode and Martin accidentally eats a pot brownie. And I just, I don't think I've ever laughed harder. <laughs> then there's this scene, the whole, it's, it's another farce. It's the whole premise is Niles is trying to unleash his wild side that he never did as, a, as an adolescent. So he buys a pot brownie and he accidentally mixes it up with Martin and Martin eats it. So Niles thinks he's high, but Martin's actually high. And there's a scene where Frazier realizes what's going on and Niles is laughing, but then you hear Martin at the door with his keys and you can hear the keys drop to the ground and Martin just starts cackling with laughter. And it's, 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 it's this thing with that show is you don't even need punchlines. If you set up the story right with that show and the farce and all the stuff that's happening, you'll get the biggest laugh in the world off a look or off a, an off camera laugh or just Niles going, oh, wow. Like, it's the biggest laugh in the world because they've set it up so yeah. elegantly and pristinely that it's like, it's just, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. The bar's way too high. I'm going to really blow this thing. Ah, I'm going to kill this thing that I love. I, I know it. I'm going to blow it. <laughs> I'm never going to make it back. Um, to answer your question, I love all the episodes. All the episodes are my favorite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can definitely like get a lot out of those reactions. I watched the ski trip episode today and like, a lot of it was just the face reactions they gave and like you, the audience knows what's going on, but the characters don't. And like just seeing their that, faces makes you, you the, know, the biggest I read, it was, I think Joe Keenan wrote that episode and he had an article about it somewhere. And he was like the biggest laugh that he had ever heard, I think on that show was when the ski instructor Guy like checks out Niles' butt because the audience knows that Guy is gay, but nobody else knows that Guy is gay. Yep. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's yep. unbelievable. <laughs> you guys should watch the show if you haven't. It's really yep. good. <laughs> yep. It's, yeah, it's, it's been a while enough. for me. Yeah. Oh, you should check it out. It holds up. Very I need job. to. I need to watch it again. Yeah. yeah now listening to all of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go back and rewatch it. <laughs> uh, well, what would you say are the main differences between single cam and multi cam writing, in your experience? Um, I, uh, I think it. I think it's honestly pacing. I, it's it's pace of joke for me. I feel like with a good multi cam, like 
you know, like Raymond or Frazier or, or Seinfeld, you're getting like three jokes a page, even like last man standing. It's joke, 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 a couple exposition lines, joke, 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 joke. Um, single cam just, I mean, unless you're like, you know, the office or 30 rock or Kimmy Schmidt, where it's like the same pacing of jokes. I feel like single cams take a little bit longer. They, they take their time developing a story and they take their time sort of wandering around with the characters and what they want to do. Um, which can be very good. I've always, I've always, to me, a multicam always plays more like a play. Like I think I was saying earlier, where it's just like, you have this one scene, you have characters coming in and out. You'll maybe see three or four other scenes, but everything's happening in this one space. So there's no crutch of like a flashback pop. And there's no crutch of like going to a talking head. It's just like, all, everything's right there in front of you and everyone's got to be right on time. And, and Kim, you get, you know, 30 takes for something. If you're in front of a live audience, you're getting a couple tries at it. Like the audience is going to get sick of it. So you don't, it's really is that sort of lightning in a bottle thing where you get one shot at it. You got to bring your A game. And, and, and it's just, it's just the energy to me is always big and fun. Like even show nights, like if you're on a multicam staff, you're down on set with all the other writers watching it. You're pitching jokes. If something doesn't work, you pitch a new joke and you try it out. Single cam. It's just, it's very different. It's almost like you're shooting a movie. Um, and it, both are good. I mean, there's obviously great examples of both. I always tend to lean more towards a multi just cause I love that sort of love that energy and sort of the dynamic of it. Um, and it's hard because there's not a ton of great multicams out there. There's good ones like Chuck Lorre obviously knows what he's doing, but there's, there's not a lot of options for good multicams. Like there were so many for so long and, and I'm hoping they'll start coming back. I mean, I try and write one that fails every year. So I, I know I'm doing my part, but I'm hoping <laughs> other people are too. Uh, oh, also all the action lines in multicam are capitalized in the script. Single cam, not capitalized. So that's a big difference. And usually the dialogue's uh, double spaced, correct? Sure. <laughs> spaced, sure. Also a big difference. Spacing's a big difference. Game changer. <laughs> that was the kind of answer you're looking for, right? Revolutionary. <laughs> Uh, you've also worked on Late Night with Conan. Uh, so can you tell us about that, being a researcher for Conan? The Conan job was probably the, probably the coolest job I've ever had. My only job was to, whatever the musical guest was on Conan that day, I would get them when they showed up to 30 Rock around like 10 a.m. or whatever, and I would hang out with them until 5 p.m. when they went on, and I would just get them food or I'd get them alcohol, whatever they wanted. I was just there to, to hang out and make sure they were comfortable. And at the time... Conan had like the coolest musical guests on at late night. Like it was every cool band you can think of. Like I have, I have stories of me with, with Adele, Al Green, Pink, Death Cab for Cutie, uh, uh, Nora Jones, like literally anybody that's, it was, it was the coolest job in the world and I didn't get paid for it, but I got them sandwiches and stuff. <laughs> you got paid in awesome. experience. <laughs> oh man. It was the best. Uh, and so I was there, I was there until late night ended. I, I was at late night for like the last two years and the show moved out to LA. And the show was basically like to the, to the assistants and the interns, if you move to LA, we could probably get you a job. So I was like, cool. So I moved to LA and I got a job as a researcher. Um, and I really wanted to be a writer, but his writers are all so good and talented and they've all been with him since like, you know, 93 and they weren't leaving anywhere. It's like one of the best jobs in show business. So once you realize that you can't get in there, you sort of just have to leave. I don't think anybody works there between like 26 and like 38 years old. Cause either you've been there forever and you're not going anywhere or you're there in the beginning. You're like, Oh, I can move. Ah, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> I got to go somewhere else. Um, but he was always the best. I mean, when that's, when our show got canceled, when hit, we got the tonight show and then the tonight show got canceled, there was like a four or five month gap before we got Conan on TBS. And I think, and I could be, yeah. he gave everybody like a severance of like, three months pay or four months pay. It was like, I'm going to hire you all back, but I want you to be okay. Cause you all just moved out to LA. And it was just like, so nice and awesome. I like, I bought a forerunner and then I just waited for another job to come around. <laughs> How many people followed him to LA? The whole, I mean, most of the staff, I think there was a couple of people that are, that stayed in New York, but largely, I mean, like my wife's aunt worked on the show at late night and she moved out here with her family. I know most of the writers moved out here. A lot of the producers, even a lot of the assistants, like I was an intern and I moved out here. It was just such a cool, 
was such a cool experience and such a cool show to be on that you wanted to stay a part of it as long as you could. And I wish I could still be there, but I just, I, I couldn't keep researching forever. I wanted to, I wanted to write stuff. <laughs> so Joe, what about your experience on Perfect Harmony? Did you enjoy writing uh, a show that includes musical numbers? How was that for you? I love a musical number. I, I love it so much. And the creator of that show, Leslie, Leslie Wake Webster, who I believe has been on this, on your your four yeah. many times. She came to the she came to the Land Junkies, I think it was like just before you or just after you. I can't remember. Um, but we had her in the theater when it was when it was live. <laughs> very, very tall lady. Big fan. Um, but she's she's so she's so smart and awesome and nice and great. And I loved working for her on that show. She had such a good such a good show. I, I wish it, I wish it just had, I wish it clicked a little bit more with the audience because I would have loved to keep working on that. I love a musical number. I wrote a music, I was trying to write a musical for forever that I thought was so clever and fun. And then like last year I read about an Apple show called Schmigadoon, which is the exact same premise. And it just, now I can't do mine any. Mine was like, I was like some runaway finds a small town and it's just a musical and she can't get out and she's stuck in a musical. And that's pretty much what Schmigadoon is. And I was just like, <laughs> Dang. and I read the script for it. I read the script for Schmigadoon and it was like a million times better than anything I would have ever done. So it was like, <laughs> God damn it. Well, mine's garbage. I have like a 10% good version of this. So see a script. <laughs> um, but I love musical numbers. On Life in Pieces, I got to write and I, I, I'm positive none of you saw this, but I got to write, Samantha was in a school play and it was Silence of the Lambs, the musical. <laughs> and I got to, and it was so much fun writing lyrics for like a fake middle school production of <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, A Starling is Born, I believe is the title of it. <laughs> one of my proudest, one of my proudest moments that I'm sure only my mom saw. I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> oh, oh, good luck, but you can't find it. No. <laughs> do you when you're writing do you get to write some of the choreography i mean not specific choreography but i don't know a little bit of like where they're going and what they're doing or well it's uh i i think what you're asking the answer is no but like in the thing like i know that i wrote you know a bunch of paunchy middle schoolers are holding moths up and like dancing in leotards. Like I didn't give them real choreography, but I like a couple people are holding baskets with lotion in them as they dance around. Um, <laughs> but like there's, there's fun stuff you can do. I remember writing an episode where in Life of Bees where Dan Bacadal's character was dressed as Cinderella. It was like a basketball story and he had a whole thing about why he had to dress as Cinderella for a game. It was like a, it was like a, it was like a, a, a ritual, like a superstition thing. And I remember writing the stage direction, Tim waltzes with himself. And I still remember Dan on set in a Cinderella dress, like waltzing by himself. So like, there's a lot of stuff. Like mostly, most, most actors are very good and they'll come up with their own stuff to do on set. But every now and then you throw them like a little tiny nugget of nothing and they make it very, very funny. So action lines weirdly matter sometimes. Yeah. That answered my question. That basically was, was what I was going for. <laughs> Um, so for Life in Pieces, how much did you and the other writers bring in of your own experiences, your own life experiences? Oh, I think all of it. I, I think every story on that show came from someone's real life story, whether it was maybe a bit exaggerated or was just a kernel that, that sprang into something else different. I, I, I'd say I'd fairly confident on that show and, and most shows usually the best stories are ones that are organic to people's lives because they're always going to be more relatable and grounded mm -hmm. um somebody will have some somebody will I, I you can remember times somebody will walk in and say this thing happened to me and it's like oh that's a good episode let's try that and then you just sort of figure out how it works um yeah i think it's I think it's more rare to just come up with something out of the blue especially in those like life in pieces which is a grounded family show that stuff feels real. So it's, it's not going to work if you're like, well, what if Tim uh, hires a hot air balloonist to come? Well, I don't, is he really going to hire a hot air balloonist? And what about, how about he just gets in an argument with his mother-in-law? Okay, that's good too. Let's do that. <laughs> so it's would, like, I, would you have the moments where you'd sit down and be like, let's talk about things that happen in your family and then we'll pull from that? Or did people more so yeah. bring the experiences? And then, um, so they would have the idea for the story versus 
coming with their experiences. Well, that makes sense. I remember Life in Pieces in particular because that Justin Adler, who created that show, his his whole thing for the show was he wanted to get the seminal moments in people's lives. Like the pilot, I think, was like the birth of a child, the funeral, uh, someone having their period. And I forget what the fourth seminal moment was. But his whole thing was he wanted these four stories in each episode to be an important moment. He didn't want to just do the episode where it's like, just your run of the mill episode 14 of a sitcom. He wanted to do, this is where somebody got engaged. This is a 13th birthday party. This is where a uh, mother realizes their child is growing up. So I remember, I feel like the first day, the first couple of weeks of each season, we'd spend writing all these ideas on the board, like dozens, if not hundreds of ideas of like, what are seminal moments? What are unique experiences that people have that we can, we can do. And I remember it was, season three or season four and he had this idea to do a miscarriage story which everyone bucked up against so hard and was like no nobody wants to do that and to his credit he just kept pushing he's like no it's relatable it happens to a lot of people people have stories about it and we did we did a story about zoe lister jones's character jen having a miscarriage and it was really really well done it was really it was really good and it was clever and it was sharp and it was just like okay, this show can be, this show can be really, really cool. And then we also did an episode where based on um, one of the writers, Brad, who almost pooped his pants while in a magic trick. So I think the show has these sort of uh, levels it can go to on two different ends of the spectrum, which is nice. Mm -hmm. That is fun. Do you have a favorite writer or showrunner you've worked with? Oh man, I think I have to say Chris Harris. Uh, gosh. Because I have, because he's sort of in charge. Um, no, I, I haven't. I don't think I've worked with a bad showrunner. I think everyone I've worked with has been super, super good at what. They, I mean, if they're a showrunner, they they know what they're doing. Leslie was incredible. Justin was super smart and funny at Life in Pieces. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to get in that. It's hard to get all the way to that that top point and be just dumb and bad at it. So I think there are some people that are just another level above, but everyone's just, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to fail that hard, that hard upwards. I think I'm sure people do. I am. I'm currently doing it. <laughs> no. We have faith in you. Oh, thank you so much. It means so much. You don't even know how tall I am. It's amazing. Yeah. I love that you have this <laughs> I think we should be clear too to our listeners that Joe, uh, he decides how um, how good of a person you are based on your height. <laughs> oh, were we not recording for that? Yeah, yeah. Height is very important. That's my biggest. That's my biggest problem with the Zoom rooms. No idea what people's heights are. I, I don't like it. <laughs> So can you talk about um, your like personal deadlines? Do you have deadlines every day, or do you have um, like how do you set deadlines for yourself? Uh, I think, um, it's, it's, it's hard because I have four kids that are all under four. So I don't get a ton of writing done during the day if, if ever. Um, so really I usually, my kids are all in bed by like eight and then I want to spend some time with my wife. So me and my wife, Jessica will watch TV or talk for, from like eight to 10 and then she'll go to bed at 10 and then I'll work from like 10 to midnight. So it's hard to set a deadline because I'm always so tired and not wanting to do anything. And then always like two nights of the week, I'm like, somebody sent a script that they want to notes on, or I have to read something for staffing. It's just, so it's very rare that I'm just getting like all these <laughs> hours allocated to just working. So I always, I've always worked with my deadline is just, is, is crippling panic that I'm going to lose my house, I'm going to fail my family. So whenever I have a chance to work, I just get as much done as I can. And I, I'll just, I just go full throttle the whole time. I, I for me, crippling panic is the best motivator. I think if, <laughs> if you're not working from a place of crippling panic, you have no business being out here. You're never going to be successful if you already have money and you don't really care if you're working. I'm texting my agent every day. Why don't I have a job yet? And I have it's not happening yet. So I'm texting you every day for a different job. And that's how you be successful out here by crippling, <laughs> crippling panic. So no, I don't have deadlines. I just worry that my family's gonna die poor 
And that's what I have to deal with. Does that answer the question? I feel like I answered the question. The question to life. <laughs> I was going to ask uh, if you had any favorite yeah. writing advice, but it sounds like crippling panic is, is that. Crippling panic. Crippling panic and not being afraid to Google whatever you want while you're writing. I, I think I can work for maybe like 10 to 15 minutes at a clip before I go check Twitter or CNN or ESPN. I think as long as you give yourself, I mean, I'm getting at most two hours, <laughs> but as long as you give yourself that chunk of time, do whatever you want with it. Even if you're not writing, you're thinking subconsciously about what you're doing. So staring at a page and staring at words isn't always helpful. I find taking the dog for a walk and thinking is good or just going to bed with a problem in your head is good. And then, you know, you bring it to Chris Harris and he solves it for you. <laughs> Sounds solid. <laughs> I'm getting from, uh, from this that uh, we need to all make friends with Chris Harris. <laughs> oh, I would. He's very good. <laughs> Here, let me give you his address. Do you guys have a pen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, and phone number, please. Right. Yeah, yeah, let me get that. <laughs> and <part>. email, <laughs> and anyone in his life's email and phone number. <laughs> oh, he's gonna be psyched. <laughs> he was just texting me today. He he texted me today. I know you know this, but if lunatics approach you on Twitter with their Fraser specs, you can't read them. <laughs> no, and I was sending him. I was sending him like messages. I'm getting on like Instagram and Twitter that are just. I mean, some are just like. Oh, this person's trying really hard. I see what they're doing. I mean, they're 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 taking their shot, and other people are just like, I should be on Frasier with like no with no reasoning behind it. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, block. <laughs> but thank you for your interest. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so you know, don't be a lunatic. Be a normal person, and you might get a job. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we know that you love Frasier, but outside of that, what are your favorite types of stories to tell? Uh, I find uh, I, I always lean towards um, grounded, grounded relationship based stories. Like I love I love an adult sibling relationship, I think is always very funny. I think a married couple is always very funny. I, I, I wrote a pilot last year or two years ago called 137 Things My Wife Hates About Me, which is probably my favorite thing I ever wrote because it's just it's a deep dive into my wife and I's relationship about why she hates me so much. And I think anybody that's been married for more than a year hates the person they're with, but loves them just a little bit more than they hate them. And if they're, if they're, if they don't say that that's true, then they're liars and they have bigger problems than anybody else knows. Um, I, but I love a grounded, like I'll always enjoy working on a workplace comedy show. Like perfect harmony is basically a workplace comedy, even though there wasn't a real workplace but whenever I'm starting from scratch, it's always usually those, those personal relationships, whether I like, I like a lot of baggage in a relationship, like, like adults, I feel like me my brother and my sister have a lot of inside jokes, have a lot of resentment, have a lot of competition. And I feel like those are the kinds of relationships that I like seeing on, I like seeing on TV because they're so much deeper than like a married like, like if you're married to someone you've been married a couple of years but you're adult siblings you've been with like 30 years and you really hate those people or you really love those people so or those both. or both <laughs> um but i always i always tend to lean towards because I, I i i do love broad humor and i love big jokes and i like hard jokes so i feel like you have to start at a place that's super grounded to earn that kind of stuff i can't i can't be working on a show that's based on jupiter and then pitch the joke about the hot air balloonist. I have to start at a place where it's a couple that lives next door to another couple, and then there's a hot air balloonist. <laughs> what are you uh, currently watching that you'd recommend? Uh, you know, we know Frasier, but... Of course. Yeah. Well, I have to watch Frasier from 1 to 3 a.m. every night. That's in my contract. Um, <laughs> God, it's so, it's so weird. Cause we're flying through stuff now because this pandemic so we're, we're we're so fast through things but most recently i've enjoyed um i can't honestly can't remember the last comedy that i've even watched that i i th I, th I think uh, some some comedy writers like this too i i, I don't like to watch other comedies because i'm so worried that i'm going to see something that's better than anything i can do so it's just gonna it's gonna hurt me and if it doesn't hurt me it's gonna subconsciously stay with me and then i'll accidentally steal it which i also don't want to do 
So I tend to lean more towards dramas. Um, my, uh, Jessica and I just watched a Netflix movie called The Invisible Guest, which I very much enjoyed. If anyone has seen that, it's, it's in Spanish and subtitled, but it's very, very good. It's a very good movie. Um, love a true crime documentary. Uh, we just watched Firefly Lane. I don't know why. It was, that was pretty good. <laughs> Watch This Is Us every week. My, look, I'm not watching real cutting edge stuff, I don't think. <laughs> I think I'm more in the sort of the mainstream area. I'm not watching really cool stuff. Um, uh, and, then, is- and then, and then, and uh, then the big thing I'm watching after my wife goes to bed and I pretend I'm working is a British show called Friday Night Dinner, which is something that's on Amazon Prime for free that you can watch right now, which is very enjoyable. Okay. <laughs> Well, what what are spread? Yeah, what are the cool shows you feel like you should be watching? Oh yeah, yeah. Search Party. But I just don't. Get oh it. yes. But I think, <laughs> but I think, I think I'm supposed to love it. I watched everyone. It was either on Perfect Harmony or Life in Pieces. Everyone loved it, and I literally watched the first season in like a night. And I was so mad. I just didn't get it. I think I'm not cool enough. I think they're way too cool and hip, and I just didn't get it. I might have been maybe a little too drunk to get it. But I think people really love that show and it's really cool. And I, I don't get it. I'd rather watch Raymond. So I'm, I'm 35. So that's not the right answer for me. I feel like WandaVision is kind of that show right now. Everyone's like, watch WandaVision. I still still haven't quite. Okay. I love, okay. I'm watch, That I am watching. I love WandaVision. But I haven't seen anything else in the Marvel Universe, so I'm a little lost. I know that I'm missing a ton of Easter eggs, and I know I'm missing a ton of plot points, but I'm really, I really like his makeup, and I think it's really fun with the TV tropes. So I don't think I'm the audience for it, but I love it. And Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso is also very good. Can I ask really quick about uh, 100, uh, 137 things my wife hates about me? Um, like, what was, is there, are there 137 things? Like, is there a list or like, what was that number specific? Oh, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, it's no, a the, good, great number. The number sounded funny. The number sounded funny and would force at least six seasons. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, I would always talk about at the Life in Pieces room, things my wife hated about me. Like she hates the way I breathe. She hates the way my feet look. She hates the way I sing to myself when I'm doing the dishes. And my friend Liz Tippett was like, you should write a show about that. Just call it like, you know, a million things my wife hates about me. And I was like, that's dumb. But 137 seems really clever. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I wrote the pitch for it and I, I, all the examples I have are real. Like she hates the way I hum. She hates the way I touch my hair. She hates the way I say croissant. So it's so easy to write something like that. It's so based in reality. Like you can sell it with barely even trying. It's like, wow, this guy's wife really hates him. We should help him out. <laughs> we'll see it someday? So, oh, no. But <laughs> to be clear, and this was the biggest part of the pitch, she's right. I'm awful. So I want to be very <laughs> clear. This isn't like some weird misogynistic, oh, my wife's such a nag. That... No, 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 no. <laughs> she's, she's very right. <laughs> I am beyond obnoxious. Uh, and that's uh, it's it, it tonally. I think there'll be a lot like I don't really know what the show is on AMC. I think it's called Kevin Can Go Fuck Himself. I think is what it's called. But it's basically like the sitcom wife that's had enough of like being that person, which is what I was trying to do. I wanted this the wife to be the person you're like, oh, I understand this person. She's with a buffoon, and I support her. Um, <laughs> but no, it'll never see the light of day. It's it's better than a it's, it's dead. Unless I get Chris Harris on board, then maybe I can maybe I can bring some life into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Harrison, a bunch of tall people. Ah, <laughs> oh, the tallest, just the tallest people. <laughs> That's how awesome. you sell a show. <laughs> Subscribe for more episodes and check out Sketches. Sketches written and performed by Deadline Junkies. Watch it at skedjes.com. Thanks for listening to the Deadline Junkies podcast.